Hi everybody, welcome to TWR Facebook Live. Uh, once again, I am here in Dharamsala, India, uh, in Norbu House. Uh, as you can see behind me, somebody have asked a question about this beautiful art. Uh, this is actually, I'm just sitting in uh, uh, the breakfast area in the morning, uh, but the hotel is very beautiful, um, all the beautiful ornaments. So I'm just sitting here. So, so today is um, the question and answer. Um, about the meditation of dissolving the ego. Uh, so I want, just wanted to say maybe a few words. Um, in, in a tradition, in a dharma, uh, we talk about samsara, we say samsara, korva, uh, and the definition of samsara and korva, we say the, the one who possess as a result of grasping or dangzi wanki dungal chepa so the one who possess the discomfort or suffering as a result of grasping so this is what uh, we are uh, I mean everybody experiences very much in our life that every given moment, that whenever we experience any kind of discomfort or any kind of conflict or any kind of pain, uh, it's clearly, uh, very simply and clearly uh, related to grasping mind. So we actually just grasp and we are not able to let go of grasping. And that's ex exactly why it produces the discomfort or the suffering. So, and also, we all know that in our life, many times, at least I definitely feel sometimes, it seems like uh, the suffering is very much part of our life, of our existence. And somehow, uh, it seems like we kind of have to experience that. Um, experiencing suffering, experiencing discomfort, experiencing conflict, it's a part of our evolving growth, development, uh, discoveries. And so I think it's very much part of our uh, self. So it's kind of very important. But the question is here, it's more important when we do um, feel conflict or when we do suffer, when we do when we are in pain, do we recognize, do we grow through that? Does it help us? Does it make us recognize anything? That is, I think, the most important question here is that, that, that each individual person, it might be very, very different. So for all of us, I think any time when we feel any challenge or suffering pain, do we recognize anything? Does it help us? So that is, I think, the very important question that we should always remember to ask ourselves. And here also, also like uh, it seems very clear that uh, um, the ego can only survive when you are in conflict. Ego can only survive when you are in pain. Ego can only survive when you're thinking or thinking repeatedly, thinking, thinking negatively. Um, when ego can only survive when you are fear, when you are um, turning the wheels of fear, chains of fears. And that's the only way ego can survive. So in some sense, for the survival of ego, we need to, to suffer, we need to, to feel conflict, we need to, to create conflict. Uh, it seems like that's what happens in everyday life. But, the, but if somebody has a little bit more realization, uh, somebody is able to uh, have ability to self-reflect well, then I don't think 
it's necessary to suffer. I don't think it's necessary to me necessary to keep uh, I say saving ego, preserving ego, f feeding ego. It's not necessary because why it's not necessary? Because you found yourself, you have self-realization, you have a, a sense of a connection to who you are yourself. So when you know who you are or when you have that realization, then ego has no place. Because ego is like a false creation. Uh, so that's what I think is very important to understand. Generally, I think it's important to understand this, that survival of ego, we suffer, and when there is a self-realization, there is no need to suffer, there is no need to create ego, because there is a true self or true realization of self already present in your life. I think that's kind of the core part of the message. So there are a few questions here I wanted to, I mean, a few very, very good questions, but I don't I mean, we will not have time to go through all of them. I just uh, wanted to maybe discuss a few of them. So Maria is asking the question. It says, uh, creations started in childhood. How on earth am I going to stop grasping? Thinking is one thing, doing it, it is something else. So, uh, so that's very true. Um, so, some sense, um, as a baby, very, as a very little child, and we, they, you can see they are learning to grasp their toys. And uh, maybe in the beginning part, they are seeing toys as just as a toys, not necessarily yours, or not necessarily mine, but they are just toys. And slowly they began to build an attachment, uh, feel the territorial, and they began to say, oh, it's my toy, it's not your toy, I'm going to share when I wanted to share, but I don't want to share with you today. So it becomes very kind of territorial and kind of sharing, a sense of grasping. From very, very childhood, uh, we definitely do that. And as we grow up, of course, it's a, it's harder uh, to you know. It's, it, when we're growing up, of course, we naturally also have a lot of things that we grasp, uh, but it's harder to recognize. Um, for example, in some cultural culture, teaches you how to grasp so much. Uh, one thing that I'm always amazed by, like in the Western world when the children are growing up and uh, when they are very little, like at a couple of three, four years old, five years old, uh, people are asking immediately saying, what do you want to do when you grow up? What do you, what do you want to become when you grow up? What do you want to have when you grow up? Um, so basically, from very early childhood, they are encouraged or kind of forced socially to grasp to want something, to need something, and they are forced to that. So somehow they grow, they grow up this thinking that I need so much in order to be happy. I need to, to grasp so much in order to be happy, but that is not true. That is absolutely not true. It's a, so in some sense, uh, these are taught very early age. Uh, for example, I mean, this is kind of simple example in my life, um, around age 10, um, when I was uh, first time went to the monastery, uh, I just went to the monastery because my parents brought me there and uh, because I met my teacher. And uh, so I began to learn, uh, get teachings, um, uh, practice, and uh, doing practices with my teachers. And um, living in the life of monk in the monastery. Uh, but, but whatever you're learning, whatever you're doing every day, I never thought of, okay, I'm doing this because I will do this in order to do something else. 
or oh, I will, I will, I'm learning these things because I wanted to go to the West, I wanted to teach, I wanted to do this and I don't want to do that. No, none of those thoughts were there. Going to the teaching, receiving teaching, reflecting on the teaching, trying to practice was just part of my life until I was like 27, 28. Uh, never thought about job, never thought about anything. So it's a very much part, part of upbringing. We were not taught to grasp so much. I'm not saying absolutely I grasp. But I'm not saying none of um, lamas or not, they don't grasp, I'm not saying that, but definitely not as much. Definitely we are not taught to do that as much as you're growing up. So in the West, very often children are asked what you wanted to do. And I, sometimes I think uh, it seems like, I'm not sure if that's a really good thing to do that because uh, um, as an adult, we lose, I think one thing I feel that one thing we lose is the quality of innocent quality of the child. The ability to feel the, the youth, the child or the, the playfulness of the child, no, regardless of how old you are. Um, that youth, that playfulness, when that is gone from your life, I think in a way your life is gone. So that youth, that playfulness should always protect and always keep alive regardless of how old your body is getting. I think that is, that is very, very important. important. So, so anyway, to make it short, uh, I think uh, the grasping is definitely part of our life and, uh, and we can definitely reduce it, we can definitely uh, not grasp as much, as long, as often. There is a definitely a lot of space to uh, improve uh, gr grasping less. And I can clearly say that it's possible to achieve that, achieve that. So it's not like, um, uh, I would not agree if somebody says, well, uh, you grow up as a child and you, you naturally grasp and whatever level of, from scale 1 to 10, if you are the one who grasps scale 8, you will always grasp scale 8 regardless of what you do or meditate, not meditate, until you die you, will, you, are, you are going to grasp uh, scale level 8 or another person you are going to grasp scale level 5 regardless of what you do. And I absolutely do not agree with that. I think you can definitely grasp less as you are more conscious and more aware. So I think that's uh, one question there. Um, so another question here, Maureen asking question, how do we self-liberate big chunk of issues instead of going one issue at a time? That's a very good question. That would be great. Um, so let's think about that. For example, the metaphor in a computer, uh, in computer, um, you, you can look at your, uh, junk mail, uh, junk mail. So you can see all the junk mails and you can say, oh, I have 100 junk mails and you can do two things. One, you can go through each one of these junk mail and trying to see some of them, you it's not a junk, you need, need them, so you save them. Or you can say, you, you select and delete, you select and delete of one by one. So that's one approach. That is the uh, approach of a conceptual mind uh, deleting the files approach, conceptual mind deleting the file. So the non-conceptual awareness deleting a collective file will be shift A, select all, that then when they select all, then when you, when you press the delete button, it de deletes all the files which you have been selected. So uh, 
it's funny thing is that uh, selecting a shift A, like R, so R is like a, a Dzogchen um, primordial sound. Um, so R is the uh, kind of very important Dzogchen, so selecting all key, key uh, how you say, key on the computer. So, so the, of course there's a two way to do it. So one, uh, you are able to delete a lot of file at one time, a lot of kind of grasping mind at one time. Another time, you do only one at the time. So what would we make the differences? I think, I, th I think in some sense that when you are aware of yourself, you have your ability to delete more collective, more a chunk of file or many file or all file, when you are conscious of yourself, when there is awareness of self or self-realization. But when you are trying to, when you don't have a self-awareness, when you are trying to be aware of a specific events, issues, objects, dualistic objects, like um, working on one specific outer object, and then when you clear one object, you only clear one object. You have a problem with another object. For example, if you are afraid of, you, if you have a fear, then you are afraid of people, then you, maybe you are afraid in a relationship with a person. Then you are afraid to work a project with somebody. Then you are afraid to work for somebody, uh, work with somebody, uh, because you are your, and then when you, oh, you are afraid of relating to somebody, so then you can say, well, I don't want you to relate, I don't want to have a relationship because I'm afraid of relationship. So you, you, you stop having relationship and then maybe the relationship fear you, had to, you don't have anymore, but you still have a, a fear of your boss or fear of your colleague, uh, issue of trust, maybe something like that. So you, bottom line, what I'm saying is that you're going to have each issues of fear with the, related with a different person. You get rid of one, you have another one. You get rid of second one, you have the third one. But you're not going to get rid of all of them one time because each of them are, ex you are looking out, outward objectively sin. But if you are as a subjectively, if you are looking inward, rather than uh, who you are afraid, what you are afraid, the one who is afraid, one, the one who is fearful as a subject, when you're aware of that, when you're aware of self-realize that, and then I think it's 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 it cuts all fears. When you have when you overcome internally fear, you you overcome fear in relationship. You overcome fear in working with somebody. You overcome fear working for somebody, and so on. Because you came, you overcame fear. It's subjective sense of overcoming fear and objective sense of each object related to overcoming fear, it's a very, very big difference. So, good example is, if you cut one bamboo, and if you realize that bamboo is empty, then you don't have to keep on cutting all the bamboos. Because you know all the bamboos are empty by knowing one bamboo is empty. So that one bamboo, empty bamboo, it's you. When you know the space, awareness of space is in you, in you, and the awareness of space has ability to overcome fear, overcome all fears, then you, you, are, you overcome fear with anything outer related. So, so that's, I think, um, um, well, anyway, like in a Dzogchen teaching, it's, it always says, one single wisdom as a medicine for every afflictions. So countless afflictions, thousands of afflictions, thousands of negative emotions and pains, there's only one wisdom, that one wisdom is the wisdom of self-realization. It's not a wisdom of uh, dis discovering a truth in each object. It's a self-realization. It's, it's realization of yourself. So that is 
um, I think it's important to understand. So then uh, there is a question, Andrew asking a question, does the ego experience the fear in the dissolution process? Yes, absolutely. Uh, ego experience fear in the dis dissolution process of the fear. So whenever fear is dissolving, um, ego, so basically you feel fearful when your ego is dissolving. Um, why you feel fearful when your ego is dissolving? Because e your ego, a sense of wrong sense of I, the false sense of I, the only sense of I that you are familiar with, it's ending, it's dying, it's losing. And when it loses, that's only what you have. And obviously you are going to be afraid because you're losing only what you have. And you're losing yourself. You're lose, it's, in truth is you're not losing yourself, but you feel like you're losing yourself because your ego is which you identify with as yourself. The, so what is the medicine to not to feel that way? Is your ego is not you. You can lose your ego, but you will not lose yourself. Your pain is not you. You can have pain, uh, but it's not you. The moment you realize, the moment you're able to see, experience, observe your pain uh, without uh, identifying with it, that very moment, the f pain, the fear, the conflict, they all begin to um, shift and transform. So be because of the power of realization. So this is obviously very important. Many times during meditation, people will talk about it. I think we say um, the fear of emptiness. The fear of emptiness. And the fear of emptiness, people do feel that during the meditation and they feel like a sense of kind of uh, losing something. And um, that's a very, very normal experience. And, and, and for some people it could be very strong. When it's very strong, you have to be a little more careful and like kind of maybe stop meditating. Uh, you have to kind of rest, relax, and not force yourself. Um, but it, that experience is very, very common. So let's see. Number four, or the question number four. So when you are in coyote environment, uh, how how you manage to not lose and and stay calm and stay in stay in peace. So when a lot of a uh, lot of things are happening around you, uh, how you manage to stay calm and how you manage to stay quiet. That's a very good question. Okay, so. Let's uh, look at a little bit that experience. Let's look at this very, this very moment. As I'm speaking, as you're listening, how much you are connected to yourself. being aware of your body, being aware of your breath, being aware of your mind, feelings. How much you are aware of me, how much you are aware of what I'm saying, how, how much you're hearing, how much you're listening. So definitely, the question is how much you are connected to yourself and how much you are connected to me. It's possible that neither you are connected with yourself nor you are connected with me. You are 
body is just pretending to be sitting there, listening to me, but it's not happening. You're gone and you're not even aware that you're gone. When you are gone, then the disconnection is there. When you are disconnected, then it's not easy to be aware, easy to be calm. It's not, it's not easy to relax. It's not easy to feel connected. It's not easy to feel peaceful because you are not connected to me, to yourself, to this moment. But if you are connected to yourself, connected to this moment, connected to me, you are aware of all the things, very clearly it will help you to feel more sense of peace. So it's, it's very much about losing the connection. Every given moment when you lose the connection, then it's difficult to be calm and quiet. I think think about this like you are you are like a um, walking temple. You are like a walking shrine. You are like a walking little church. Any given moment, when you bring your attention to the silence, like right now, I hear the silence. I hope you hear the silence too. This moment, I feel the silence and I feel connected to that silence. Maybe other, other events are happening around me, it's a very busy, hectic, a lot of chaotic experiences are happening around me, but I am hearing, feeling, connected, to that silence, regardless of how noisy environment I am in. Sometimes we think the noise is affecting you, in one way it's true, but one way is that not the noise is affecting you, you are disconnected to, your, to the silence is affecting you. Not the, all the happening events around you is affecting you, but your disconnection to the inner stillness is affecting you. Not the, all the events are affecting you, your disconnectedness to that inner space, sacred space is affecting you. A bottom line, you are disconnected to yourself is affecting, affecting you, not the events around you. So of course, I think it's very important to truly witness that, that. I remember one time very, very clearly, it was like in the meeting and there was a lot of things happening around me, too much. And suddenly, I, I decided to retrieve. Retrieve does not mean I did not leave the place, I did not run away from the place, but I bring my attention inward. And I felt that stillness, silence, so strong. It's like I sometimes say, like when you have a noise cancellation earphone, you switch on, 
instantly silence. The environment, the environmental silence, this, the noises from environment, it cuts down. Instantly you hear the silence. And you feel great, you feel very, very peaceful. So when you have a choice of turning on silence, turning off noise, on silence, off noise, on silence, off noise. When you feel like you have a cho choice of turning on and off, why would you not choose? If you have confidence enough, you experience enough, if you are familiar enough of that switch and that experience, why would you not do that? Of course you will do that. I do that all the time. But how many people feel you have equally like the noise cancellation switch on and off, or even better, that does not run, run, run out of the batteries, because noise cancellation, um, the switch requires a battery. And when you don't have a battery, it does not cancel the noise. It's even better. You don't have to carry anything. It's just bringing attention to there or not. So the, so the main point, what I'm saying here, is that no matter what kind of environment you are in, you will always able to find the peace. But that peace has to be found within yourself, as we always speak. So, so I think uh, there, are, there are many other number of great questions here, and, um, but uh, I think uh, we are going to, we don't have much time. Also, um, the t I'm in a different time zone, so you know, not been not many days here uh, in uh, India, and it's uh, about close to midnight, and uh, that means uh, it's like almost like a, I don't know, the opposite of Californian time. Uh, so it's like uh, I am naturally little bit like in a meditation state. <laughs> naturally uh, silence, naturally calm state here. So, um, so we will continue uh, next week, and so I will, we will do a short meditation now. Uh, I hope we have still have some time. Okay, so just a short meditation. Take a few deep breathings, release all stale breath, the dead airs, Just for a moment, trying to be conscious, be aware in your life.
the moments when you say something really bothers me, something really hurt me, whatever situation, event, people that affected your sense of I. It shakes, kind of shaking you, the sense of I. It hurt me. They rejected me, they excluded me, they don't acknowledge me. I am afraid. So it's important to reflect in oneself those moments when you experience that and then look at that sense of I, who that is, by observing like a ca camera lens, like a turning inward and zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, basically kind of looking closer, 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 until to the point you cannot go any more closer. You kind of went beyond that and you arrive in the place, there's nothing there. There's a space. Dissolving that ego and resting in that space, that's very, very important. So just for the moment, like a conclusion, I think that's very important any time when we feel hurt to personality. I think this is what I were talking. Whenever something touches your personality, very often pain is the one, and that moment is a great opportunity to able to recognize it, recognize the ego. Well, it's not easy to recognize ego when, you know, when you are, when you feel completely okay, when you don't feel like something is shaking your eye, sense of eye, it's not easy to recognize. When you feel hurt, pain, when it bothers you, that is a great opportunity to look at it. nakedly and so closely and so closely that you don't see it anymore. That is the moment when it dissolves. You transcend, you go beyond that. So uh, every single day uh, when, you, when you encounter those moments, I think it's very important to use that. So that's uh, your opportunity. So I would recommend to continuously at least four or five times a day Whenever you feel that strong sense of I, zoom, turn the camera zoom inward and zoom in until you don't see anything than the pixels of light, then the space, then rest. And that is the meditation of dissolving the ego. Okay, so thank you very much everybody. Um, Happy to uh, continuously do this on Facebook Live. Um, even though I'm, I'm traveling, it's, it's still it's able to do that. It's, I'm amazed by able to do it. Uh, and the next, so we're traveling to to Nepal. So the next week, next Tuesday, I'll be doing the TWR Facebook Live from Kathmandu, and we'll see you. Then again, once again, I want to thank everybody who has been uh, liking the, uh, t my page and uh, commenting uh, on my page and so beautiful comments and 
definitely very inspiring um, for people, anybody who reads them. So it's a thank you for that. And also particularly, um, um, uh, thank you for sharing your, uh, with your friends, your kind of trusting and opening door of the teaching for others. And, and you are helping me to reach more people out. out. So uh, thank you so much. So, uh, um, so also a, hap a happy new year. There's a Tibetan new year is coming. So I wish you all happy new year and I will have another opportunity to wish you uh, on Tibetan Lhasa from Nepal. Thank you. Thank you very much.